Welcome to the Doctor Patient Forum podcast, a no holds barred podcast raising awareness to pain patient abandonment and the harmful results of forced opioid tapers and who's responsible for the suffering. Join us to learn how to advocate for change. Yeah, so David Alfrey, a uh, medical doctor, is joining us today on the Doctor Patient Forum podcast. Don't forget, folks, if you like what you hear today, be sure to leave us a five-star review. I'm told that's how people can find us. Uh, so let's start with the from the beginning, how I met David Alfrey. One day I was scrolling on TikTok, and I saw David, he put out a video about fentanyl, and he was getting attacked. And I don't know if I sent you an email or a DM, but I said, oh, this poor bastard is going to get <laughs> attacked. <laughs> for his, and, but I liked you, David, as soon as I saw you on TikTok. I, 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 I thought I was a pretty good judge of character, but sometimes I'm not. <laughs> you are. I, I, but uh, I just found you to be very kind, very patient, very compassionate. And you are a retired anesthesiologist. Yes. Uh, and you live in Tennessee and your wife is a pain patient. Correct. And that's think, I think that's how I connected with you. Uh, and then we started to talk on email and uh, David was kind enough to send me a copy of Saving Grace. So be sure to check this book out. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about the book in just a few minutes. But I wanted to, I want to tell Bev the other day, you know, my, my boyfriend is having his hip replaced in two weeks and we were very nervous because he gets very <clears throat> sick following anesthesia and i texted david and david you were so kind to oh. uh you know give me these suggestions and then and then my boyfriend was texting those same suggestions to the anesthesiologist in real time <laughs> oh good yeah but no anesthesiologist wants to be told how to do their job but so that's the type of guy that we're dealing with with david alfrey uh so TikTok audience be kind to him and your reels are pretty good david they're very informative and you know you give a balanced view about opioids you're not I don't think you're one to, you know, encourage doctors to prescribe all the opioids in the world, but I think because you have a loved one who struggles with pain and you are an anesthesiologist, you understand the importance of opioids. Yeah, I think I have a pretty good perspective. Um, and, and I have to say, getting on TikTok and interacting with the chronic pain community has really expanded my whole view of chronic pain, even though I live with a, a chronic pain person, you know, you, I have that personal connection, but I, I never really was able to see it on, on a broader um, horizon. Right, right. I think that's, uh, you know, I think that's important for people to know, because if you're not, if you haven't been affected by untreated pain, you wouldn't know that this is happening. And I think even when you were practicing, you probably have seen a huge shift in how we prescribe opioids from then uh, until now, right? Sure. Yeah. You know, when I started practicing, there was just about zero controversy in terms of opioids. You know, the, the fact that a doctor might prescribe an opioid, it just was no big deal. But now the pendulum has shifted so far that it's, it's such an anti-opioid basis or bias in medicine. Uh, and, and there's so much misinformation that physicians have been given that, you know, we were sort of indoctrinated into the thought that opioids are bad and we really need to avoid them at all costs. Uh, and this pendulum has shifted so far uh, against uh, giving opioids to patients, it's been very destructive. So destructive. And I mean, uh, as we can tell, like, like, look around, I mean, the overdoses, they have skyrocketed. And I don't think there's any change in the near future until doctors start treating pain again. But uh, a few days ago, the news was covering Matthew Perry's doctors being investigated for prescribing ketamine and so many different questions I have asked, you know, and Bev and I were texting last night, we're wondering why the Suboxone doctor wasn't investigated uh, because the Suboxone, you know, usually they, they keep hidden in the background as, as it's the savior and they're so focused on this ketamine. And I think you were, um, did you have a ketamine infusion center or were you involved in one? 
Yes. Uh, you know, my, my exposure to ketamine was during my entire anesthetic career where I've given it literally thousands of times to anesthetize patients. Mm -hmm. And then about 25 years ago, uh, psychiatrists stumbled onto the, the idea that it could be used to treat uh, what we call treatment-resistant depression. I've been tried on Zoloft, Wellbutrin, I'm still depressed. Mm -hmm. And it's a really effective drug for that. And then from that experience, people stumbled onto the fact that it can be used as a painkiller. And after I left my clinical practice of medicine, we set up a ketamine infusion center in Nashville, uh, and I helped staff that when our guy needed some time off. Okay, yeah, I, I got to tell you, I have a friend, my, my hairdresser, her brother was resistant to all antidepressants and ketamine, I think it was nasal ketamine, it was the only okay. thing that really worked for him. Uh, and I don't know much about ketamine as a pain patient, but I can tell you over the past six months, I have heard from many patients whose doctors have stopped using ketamine in their practice because of fear from, you know, retribution from the government. And, and now I'm afraid it's going to get much, much worse with this whole Matthew Perry case. Yeah, the, the whole Matthew Perry case, um, you know, I think people are losing sight of the fact that there were some really good doctors using ketamine from Matthew Perry. Uh, I always said that uh, if you had enough fame and enough money, you could buy the worst care in America. Uh, and Michael Jackson a good, is a good example of that. The doctors that were giving him ketamine in a ketamine infusion center were good doctors. They said, this is the safe dose. This is what we're gonna give you. We're not impressed with your celebrity. We're not impressed with your money. And they were treating him. And then you've got these charlatans that come along mm -hmm. and, you know, are supplying him ketamine on the black market. Um, and it's a general anesthetic. Uh, yeah. It's a dangerous drug unless it's in the right hands. So yeah. it's given a terrible, you know, black eye to ketamine, whereas it's a it's a, just a life altering, life saving drug for so many people. Yeah, especially yeah. people with CRPS. Let me ask you yeah. a question about the ketamine. So you can get it in an in, infusion in a clinic, yes. and then are there tro what is the word troche? D does it dissolve in the mouth? How else do you take ketamine? I know there's nasal ketamine. Yeah, it's it's usually IV or nasal. Okay. I think there are some lozenges you can get. Your friend was getting uh, something. If it was prescribed, mm -hmm. it was uh, called S-ketamine. It's right. the FDA-approved version. The problem with the nasal version is that uh, you've got to take it once or twice a week. You've got to take it in a clinic setting, and it is just horribly expensive. Yeah. Um, and as a result, uh, a lot of people will get ketamine infusions where you may need that only once a month or so. Now, the downside of that is they're pretty expensive infusions. It could be, you know, $500, $600, depending upon where you live. Sure, sure. Um, it's certainly they're making such an example of this. I'm afraid that the OIG and DEA is is preparing to really go after ketamine doctors uh, because that's what they seem to be talking about a lot. And I wonder, do ketamine doctors have good compliance plans? Like, what what do you think about that? You think they're going to well, start going after? Yeah, them? if you if you are a legitimate, if you're running a legitimate ketamine infusion center. You, you have all the safeguards. You are locking your ketamine up at night. You are very assiduously recording how much you've given to the patient, how you've wasted the excess that day. And it's like any other controlled substance. I think ketamine is a, I think it's a schedule three drug. Um, but if you're a legitimate ketamine infusion center that ought to be giving it, you have no problems, no worries. How do you waste? How do you waste? How do you waste the leftover ketamine? I never thought about that. We just uh, poured it down the sink. Okay, all right. Uh, and you know, when I called you the other day about my boyfriend, we also discussed the ERAS program, right? Yeah. So, uh, and then I started because I've gone after that a few times on TikTok, but I probably shouldn't have because it it's going to be pretty handy for yeah. uh, my boyfriend's recovery because he just doesn't do well 
with anesthesia and so violently ill. So let's talk a lot about um, the push for these. I would never agree to an opioid free surgery, me personally, mm-hmm. but let's talk about the good, the bad and the ugly with ERAS. And what does okay, ERAS so stand for? for it's our- enhanced recovery after surgery. Okay. Uh, and these programs, there's, I don't think there's a, a hospital in America that does not have ERAS programs. These things uh, sprung up about 10 or 12 years ago. um, As first of all, as a response to the increasing opiate related deaths in America. And the idea that uh, if you could reduce your opiate use, uh, reduce the prescriptions that a patient got when they went home and so forth, that that might be a good thing. And the idea that opiates in themselves have some side effects that can be unpleasant, you know, nausea and vomiting, constipation, confusion and elderly and so forth. So there was a drive, uh, first of all, I think from a sort of a, a safety idea of reducing opiates. But then the hospitals got a hold of this and said, you know, if we can get the, ho- the patient out of the hospital faster, we're going to make more money. So a big driver of this has been money as well. So enhanced recovery after surgery programs minimize opiate use. And the ultimate goal is to eliminate them. When ERAS programs work and work well, they're fantastic. I mean, who wouldn't want to be able to have surgery, have their pain controlled and not need an opiate? The problem is that practitioners uh, often take the idea that if um, uh, reducing opiates is a good thing, well, then eliminating them perioperatively <laughs> must be a great thing. Sure, yeah, sure. And, true. and you, you have to be able to, to treat what we call breakthrough pain. The typical ERAS program would be preoperatively, I might give you some Celebrex, Intraoperatively, you might get a nerve block to put your arm to sleep if you're having elbow surgery. Uh, There's a variety of agents that we can give. Ketamine is one of them uh, that reduce your opioid requirements postoperatively. And hopefully you wake up, you have no pain or you have little enough pain that you don't need an opioid. But a lot of patients still need opioids. They just don't need as much. Uh, And the problem with ERAS is when people treat it like a religion, and say, I'm just not going to give an opioid. Well, that's not the point of it. The point is to reduce the amount of opioid. Yeah. Uh, and then patients suffer if they have this breakthrough pain and they're not treated. Yeah, so they weaponized it. They pretty much hijacked uh, what was what's something that could have potentially been good. But as with everything else in the opioid reduction movement, they weaponized and we just want to thank all of our new patrons who have subscribed since our last podcast was published. Huge shout out and thank you to Melinda, Teresa, Diane, Lisa, Kathy, Lindsay, Sherry, Kim, Keith, Tracy, Lisi, Lisa, Robin, Anne, and Karen. Thank you so much for your support. I think I'm pretty sure there's studies that show that people who received opioids intraoperatively did better following surgery than the people mm-hmm who didn't receive opioids intraoperatively. Remember that study, Claudia, that they were doing for (laughs) opioid-free anesthesia? Anesthesia? Yeah, there was a a study about it, and they actually had to stop the study because I think six people ended up, they didn't die, but they had like severe events, and it was harmful, so they stopped the study, but it's weird. No one likes to talk about that one. they became Mm -hmm. tachycardic, I think. Yeah, something like that, yeah. I, I remember there was a study out of France and they were using a lot of dexmedetomidine. Now, dexmedetomidine. I think that's it. I think yeah, that's and, what you're, th- yeah. And I've used that drug hundreds of times uh, as part of my anesthetic regimen. I think they, they, they stopped that study because they had uh, such an incidence of bradycardia, very but, slow heart rate. Yep. And I think the study you're referring to, Claudia, uh, I did a reel on it a couple of months ago. It was, I think it was an annals of surgery uh, out of Mass General. Mm-hmm. And uh, I forget how many tens of thousands of patients they had. But they found that patients who had more intraoperative opioids 
and thus woke up with minimal amount of pain, as opposed to those where the opioids were really restricted, and now they hit the recovery room with a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. Those that had a more generous uh, administration intraoperatively used less opioid in the PACU, used less opioid when they were in the hospital, used less opioid after they left the hospital at one month and three months, and had less chronic pain. Yeah. So, um, interesting. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it, it, but they, it seems but they that, ignore those studies, Bev, right? Well, they it, ignore that because it seems that right now in, in, in healthcare, the number one goal is to eliminate opioids above and beyond anything else. And then everything else comes second to that. And so if you have patients who do well after surgery with opioids and patients who do, don't do quite as well without, they're still going to do the ones where they don't have, because in their minds, it's the root of all evil. And somehow if we eliminate them completely, there will not be any addiction left in this country. Yeah, there's definitely a demonization of opioids in medical education. And and I think for the majority of physicians, you know, they're not bad people in saying, I don't want to prescribe an opioid. They have been told over and over again that opioids are inherently bad, they're dangerous, and so you better not be giving them. Uh, every year in Tennessee, uh, every practitioner had to undergo a two-hour educational program on the dangers of opioids, unless you were an anesthesiologist. Uh, and because we just dealt with them all the time. Now they've even included anesthesiologists in this required mandatory training. Yeah. Um, but there's very little training in terms of how do you actually take care of a pain patient who might need an opioid? That's right. There's such in, in the CDC guidelines and in much of the education in someone who is on daily opioids, whether that's for pain or whether that's for opioid use disorder, anybody who's opioid tolerant on daily opioids, there seems to be very little focus on how do we treat them in an acute issue. And so we have people contacting us all the time who are on Suboxone for OUD or on opioids every day for pain. And not only is the hospital not giving them any extra, they're cutting their daily medication also. So now you have a patient patient in acute severe withdrawal, also in pain. And so I want to ask you from your point of view, with patients in that position, and they're in a hospital, and they're being treated like that, how do you suggest they handle that? What's the best way they can advocate for themselves? Gosh, um, I think the first the first thing to do is before you ever go to the hospital, and Claudia has has pointed this out over and over again on her reels. You've got a surgeon that's going to operate on you. Make absolutely certain they're going to take care of your pain postoperatively. And um, when she says, if you've got an orthopedist who's going to replace your knee, and he or she she says, I'm not going to prescribe an opiate postoperatively. I wouldn't go to that doctor yeah. personally. Now, I hope I don't need one, but if I've got a knee operation, I probably will. Um, you know, I don't know what to do if you're in the hospital. Um, I, I, you know, maybe you would try to notify the administration, get the administration involved and to say, look, you can't have a patient like me suffering. Uh, there are going to be consequences. How do you do and that? How do you do that, David? Because a lot of people don't know you're in the hospital and you're, you're alone. You don't have, or maybe you have your family member there, but people are so intimidated by the yeah. system. So, you know, would you ask to speak with the charge nurse first? Well, yeah. And the charge nurses, you know, they're limited in what they can do. They're basically following the doctor's orders. I think, first of all, every patient should have an advocate with them, whether it's going to the doctor, going into the hospital, because it's such a highly charged environment for you that it's, it, I mean, it's just asking too much for a patient to go through whatever medical experience they're going through and be able to advocate for themselves. So I think you have an advocate. Uh, and I think if I was in that situation, if the physician refused to treat my pain adequately, my advocate would be down at the administration office, banging on the door of the CEO to say, this can't be allowed to go on. Come on and see my wife up there and yeah. tell me that this is good medical care. That's what we did. And at one point I had, I think I had 
seven people in the room with me, including yeah. my mom. And there was an attorney. Yeah. I, it just so happened. Yeah. It, it, yeah. We went right to the, the administrators and the next risk management was in there. And I, yeah. my, my surgeon was mortified because it wasn't my surgeon. It was one of his residents. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of the, the trouble happens, but let's switch. Yeah, also post delayed. Like yeah. post-op, Claudia, had, we just had a mom reach out to us in the last few days. Her her daughter had some severe like dent, uh, jaw surgery. I think they had to break her jaw and reset it. And they yeah. wouldn't give her any medication at all. And she's like screaming in pain. And there's nothing like they call the doctor and the doctor's like, oh, well, you shouldn't be in pain anyway. So obviously you're drug seeking. They go to the emergency room and the ER doctor puts it down as drug seeking. And so it's almost like they want people to go to the street because the, there's not a whole lot of other options at this yeah. point. Another problem, yeah. David, is we're seeing uh, people go to the emergency room. Uh, they don't have a doctor to treat them because the DEA has discouraged most doctors from treating people's pain. And you've got doctors like Dr. Don Stater from this anti-opioid organization, PROP, who set up a nice career for himself, speaking out against, you know, testifying against doctors. And he's an addictions doctor and also an emergency room doctor. And his choice of pain medication is Haldol. Haldol. Yeah. Have, have you and not just that? Haldol, Claudia. He, he, he says, don't tell the patient it's Haldol right. because they know what that is. So use the generic name so, and, and make them, he said, and then the patient, he'll say, he'll say, tell the patient you're going to need a ride home. And the patient will say, oh, I'm getting the good stuff. And he's like, yeah, you're getting the good stuff. He literally teaches to... <laughs> mislead the patient and then give them Haldol. Yeah. What's your experience, what you, David, using Haldol for pain? Yeah, I, I, I don't even know where to begin with this. I mean, it is so, uh, it, when I first heard about this, it was on one of your reels and I thought Haldol. And I thought, you know, I've used Haldol. <laughs> uh, I've used it in the cardiac ICU for patients that uh, are delirious. Now we, there are other drugs we use, but 20 years ago, you'd get a small dose of Haldol if you were 80 years old, waking up wild and delirious. Haldol is an antipsychotic medication. Um, and when I saw your reel on Haldol, I thought, I got I to gotta learn about this. And so I searched PubMed. Now, PubMed is the world's repository of medical articles. It has every medical article written since 1996 over 35 million of them. And it has selected articles that go back all the way into the 1800s. And I did a search for Haldol and pain. And the amount of articles that are written on the use of Haldol to treat pain is a grand total of zero. Yeah. <laughs> There's, it, it's, I mean, it's stunning. I mean, you, you see things done in medicine, you'd say, well, the, the evidence is thin. Well, there hasn't been a lot of research on that. Well, on Haldol and pain, there's no research other than the use in a condition called um, um, a gastroparesis. But for treating pain, um, it's, uh, it, it's simply not an analgesic. So where do these ER docs get this? I went on the... Uh, American College of Emergency Physicians website. And they've got a statement that says, uh, when other methods have failed, you can try Haldol. And then I found an article of a survey of ER docs in New York. 89% had used Haldol to treat pain. The majority of them felt that it had analgesic properties the majority felt that it had been effective in treating pain with some of their patients. Now, note that they felt it had been effective. I think if you ask the patients, they might have said something different. Uh, and that they used it in an effort to avoid using opioids. There you go. So That's right. they've got a professional That's organization right. saying, hey, you might try some Haldol. Yeah. But by the way, it's not an analgesic. Yeah, they, um, they, and it's crazy because what they say is when someone presents to the emergency room, he uses a, um, kidney stones. And he's like, if someone's in the emergency room with, with kidney stones and severe pain, 
He's like, most often their pain is because they're really upset about having a kidney stone. They're really upset. So we need to calm them down. And he's like, once they calm down and then we can actually have a discussion. I'm like, you're wanting to like chemically. Yeah, it's just absurd. It's basically saying, I'm going to give you a tranquilizer. Yeah. Well, if I go into the ER and I get a broken arm, I would like you to give me a pain medicine for the pain I'm having from my broken arm. It's just, I mean, it's just to me as an anesthesiologist, as a person who treated pain every single day for 36 years, it is beyond, beyond to be what using is, Haldol. What is your view of um, ethics behind giving someone a medication like an antipsychotic and specifically not telling the patient what you're giving them? Um, I think it's unethical. You know, there, there are, well, and you have to think about the medical ethics that doctors are supposed to uh, work under. Uh, first of all, is uh, to do well, it's first of all, is beneficence. I want to do what's in the for the benefit of my patient. Another one is it's uh, it's so important to not it's better to do nothing than to do harm. Uh, another one is it's called justice. And there's a there's a fourth one in there. But beneficence is I'm going to do what my, oh, the fourth is autonomy. So you're violating two of the, uh, two of the basic medical ethics, autonomy. A patient chooses for themselves the treatment that they receive. Now, you can't, you can't say, I choose this harmful treatment. You know, you don't get to make that choice. But of acceptable treatments, patients have autonomy. They get to make the choice. And beneficence, I'm going to do what is best for you. So you're violating two of those ethics as far as I'm concerned. And the idea that you're going to slip something uh, that's not an analgesic and tell a patient they're, they're basically getting an analgesic, um, you know. They're leaving I, them. They're, they're all leaving of, them unattended in the emergency room after yeah. they're giving. Yeah. And, and But see, these prop members, they portray pain patients as we're all angry and that's why we need to be sedated and and there's this big push for antidepressants for pain and you know what are your thoughts about antidepressants for pain yeah you know i i have to say way back when when i was doing a lot of pain i i prescribed elevil for some patients uh that was really in vogue but um you know, that was a, a, another case of sort of misinformation. There really wasn't much medical literature, a little bit of medical literature to justify it. But now we know that uh, the use of antidepressants for uh, pain uh, should be limited really to diabetic neuropathy. Yeah. Uh, and duloxetine, you can, and there's something else, uh, malnisopram or something like that. Those are, those are acceptable for diabetic neuropathy, mm -hmm. but um, other antidepressants, uh, I had just read a, a huge review article on it and basically, oh, it was a Cochrane review. Yeah. Sure. And, I, I know um, that. Basically, I saw that. Yeah. yeah, there's just, there's just, you can't justify it. No. And it, I mean, these antidepressants have failed miserably in all of these studies and, uh, yes. cause I, I follow your, you do a great job in breaking down studies Had an amazing doctor who served our board of directors. He had to step down because he's going to be working with, I think he, I don't know. He's being asked to, to, um, possibly take over, um, like this. CMO or something with that hospice and palliative yeah, care. But he helps Bev break down these studies. So you do a great job. So maybe there's a place at the DPF <laughs> home for David oh, I would love that. and I studies love that. because, you know, yeah. people just, you know, my mom is going to be 89 and she believes what the media says and, and she believes what a doctor says. And I said, wait, wait a minute, we got to do our own research. Let's look at, you know, let's try to find some data. Uh, but then when you go to look at the studies, I'll call Bev. I was like, what the hell does this mean? What is this word? So <laughs> you do a great job in breaking down uh, studies Absolutely. for us. Thank you. You know, one of the things that bothers me, I think, the most about giving Haldol in that setting is that what you just mentioned, it's trust. Uh, every two months, I have dinner with a, a group of docs. We're all retired. And these are the these guys were the cream of the crop. And we were talking about trust the other night. And and we said, 
The whole basis of our profession and our treatment is based on trust. And that's why we get taken sometimes financially because we just assume the whole world will be trustworthy because it was so important, at least of my generation, to be absolutely trustworthy to your patient and to understand that treating that patient was a privilege. Well, because you're a gentleman, David, you're a gentleman. And I'm not, I'm not seeing a whole lot of gentlemen, uh, especially on, so, you know, physicians, male physicians who seem to have lost their way. I mean, the younger doctors are so different from the older doctors. And I think a lot of it has to do with, with this, see this, they lost that connection with people. See, you weren't raised on a tablet. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I, 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 I got a playlist on, on Instagram and I think it's called money and medicine. And, um, uh, when I, when I retired, I was speaking to one of the urologists and he was about retirement age. And one of us had said, you know, when we went into medicine, it was all about the patient. And then the other one said, yep. And now it's all about the money. Uh-huh. And, uh, I think money has just come to just dominate medicine. It's it's really sad. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be about the patient anymore at all. And, you know, it's interesting because the CDC guidelines in 2016, one of the main three goals that they stated was to improve patient, doctor-patient relationship with these guidelines. And I think it broke. Whatever was left in that relationship, now it's totally broken because you have these doctors who are taught, they actually believe, like you were saying, that opioids never work and that they mm-hmm. cause pain. So if you have a patient in front of you saying they work for me, then you have, what do you do with that? You have to yeah. assume they're lying or they're addicted or they're selling their medication. And so I think it destroyed the doctor patient relationship. We can't be honest. The doctor's terrified. They can't be honest. Yeah. Right. Right. And David, you left a comment under one of my videos, uh, as, as we now know, women are being denied pain medication if they have a history of pre-adolescent sexual abuse. And, oh. and and to see these doctors who have created this niche for themselves where they're now teaching other doctors or they testify against, you know, a lot of our providers who have been sent to prison, they're older solo practitioners and they would continue to treat a woman's pain even if she had a history of trauma. And you've got doctors like Dan Berland out of the University of Michigan or Tim King, and they're getting on the stand and they're saying, oh, no, you can't treat her pain. Unbelievable. Um, You know, I I would challenge them. Where is the medical evidence to justify your testimony? Um, Give me the studies which back up what you're saying. And they don't exist. No, they cite themselves. They actually cite themselves. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and, and, and as you know, I mean, pain is a, is a, is a subjective phenomenon. Um, I can't, I can't deny your pain any more than you can deny mine. Um, if a patient has pain, they have pain. And what, and, and how would, how would sexual abuse manufacture false pain or false reports of pain? I mean, it's just, I, I mean, I just can't imagine how they, how they could, give that kind of testimony. I'm going to tell you what they say is that, so there's two things. One, they say it, it increases the risk of addiction. So never give opioids. They say that. But the other side is this concept of centralized pain. Um, they call it psychophysiologic disorders. This, this like brain pain, this idea that uh, trauma in childhood causes this centralized pain. And they put a lot of illnesses in there, like uh, fibromyalgia, CRPS, Ehlers-Danlos, uh, trigeminal neuralgia, pelvic long pain. Co- Some of these long, long COVID, COVID is there now. Um, oh, no. And oh, and oh. they say these are um, psychophysiologic disorders, like they took from John Sarno's work. Um, and they, this is out of Michigan. And so they actually teach. It's so disgusting. They actually teach if you have a woman in front of you and, and you have to get out of her if she was sexually abused as a child. And even if her eye twitches when you ask, that means she was, and you have to give her a centralized pain diagnosis. They teach people to diagnose women based on whether or not they had trauma as a child. And then they say opioids are contraindicated in these women. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Well, why can't those women have legitimate pain? Exactly. You know, why, are, why are they deprived of having 
the luxury of having real legitimate pain. And it's men. Um, it's, it's, always it's always men bad. that are saying these vulgar. I, I just the only word that comes to mind when I think of doctors like Dan Berland, who said, well, 90 percent of my patients were fi with fibromyalgia were raped as little girls. Doctors don't talk like that, but they have this penchant for gir little girls and, 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 and sexual abuse. And it's weird and it's creepy. And hopefully we're going to have strong doctors start to speak out against these scumbags because that's yeah. what we need. We need leaders right now. We are swimming in an ocean filled with followers and nothing is, yeah. there's nothing such a turn off to me, David. I just yeah. hate a follower, but we're going to switch gears again. Well, Claudia, before we switch gears really fast, can you tell us your view of centralized pain? Because this is pushing the narrative right now, um, this idea of centralized pain syndromes, that they're not caused by any tissue damage just because they can't see it. Right. Um, and, and I've seen it increase over the last few years. What's your view of that? Yeah, uh, it, I don't know much about central pain, but what I do know is and you're uh, an anesthesiologist, so it, it's not like this is. It's not like the science has changed since yeah. David has gone to medical school, practiced for over yeah. thirty years, and now there's brand new science. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can there, you can have central pain as a result of uh, strokes, uh, and that is an absolutely devastating uh, situation. I've got a. I've got a friend who's a cardiac surgeon and his wife has central pain uh, as a result of uh, some little mini strokes. The other situation where I think there's a central pain mechanism is in CRPS, that uh, when you get to the latter stages of CRPS, it's not a peripheral phenomenon anymore. Now it's a central phenomenon. And that's why um, you know, people with CRPS and let's say the pain comes from their hand, you can amputate that arm and their pain doesn't go away. It's a central phenomenon. Do opioids, are opioids contraindicated in a situation like that? Like they tell in Michigan? Nothing is contraindicated. You know, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, my approach with, with medicine in general and pain in particular is whatever works. Um, and if a person says I've responded really well to, um, acupuncture. I'd say, well, it sounds like you should be seeing a, an acupuncturist. Um, I've responded well to hypnosis. Well, go to the hypnotist, whatever. It's so refreshing to hear that. Say, you're, can you, I wish we had a hundred doctors like you that we could give patients your well, name you know because what? we need to find older doctors who are retired, who yeah. can come oh. together and really start to debunk the nonsense that's being espoused by these younger indoctrinated doctors. It's actually quite simple. It can be done because the, the retired doctors, they don't, have, they don't have anything to lose. Right. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's they're not going to target them. But I think, you know, the, what Bev said, it is, it is, there is such a bias in medical education that these residents get out and, and when they're denying that pain medicine to the person that had a history of, of uh, substance abuse, and I've had a major operation, but we somehow can't give them an opioid, they think they're doing the right thing. Yeah. Right, right. And that was done on purpose. Gary Mandel and Andrew Kaladny, Gary Mandel runs Shatterproof. He joined with Andrew Kaladny and then Judy Rumler uh, runs Rumler Hope. They lobbied to have this type of um, education put into med school and nursing school. So this was yeah. done quite intentionally to indoctrinate people before they come out. And this is why you see people on TikTok, I'm sure you've seen them, pharma young pharmacists, nursing students, doctors, just absolutely mock somebody in pain and joke about yeah. it like it's just so funny. And then the poor person, like several moms have contacted us. One mom found her son unresponsive. He had dry sockets after wisdom teeth removal. Uh, doctor said, absolutely not. This is a narcotic free practice. Kid went on, uh, what is that, Snapchat, bought what yep. he thought was a pain pill. Mom found him foaming at the mouth. No. In his bedroom, he bought, it was fentanyl, right? Yep. So, And this is happening, David. There's so, let's talk oh, about the illicit fentanyl uh, and where it's coming from. Because in my opinion, I think the United States government created an epidemic that we didn't have. And now they made a much, much worse epidemic 
We never had illicit fentanyl. Europe doesn't have a fentanyl epidemic, but the United States does. How do you think we can tackle this crisis? Yeah, you know, I've done a lot of reels on this. Um, I made the point at one point that um, I guarantee you that you either have a friend or a relative who's died from illicit fentanyl, or you know somebody that's had a friend or a relative that's died. There's over a million deaths in the last 10 years uh, or 15 years. Um, uh, you know. And nidazine. I, and nidazine. Oh, oh, yeah. Night is a great subject. Love to talk about it. All of a sudden, that's really rearing its head. To me, I think you've got to go, you've got to get a, a, a really broad net. First of all, you've got to stop the fentanyl coming across the border. Uh, secondly, you, and I don't care if you're a Republican, a Democrat, whatever you are, Martian, we've got to stop this the, the drugs coming into the country. Um, to as much education as we can give out there. One of the good things that the DEA does is has a one pill can kill program, but most people have never even heard of that. And the fact is that so many of these young people, 14 to 18, take that one pill and they're dead. Uh, we lose a classroom worth of 14 to 18 year olds every week. The same number that died in Uvalde of the gunshot wounds. Uh, and we hear about that week after week after week, but we never hear about these poor kids that are dying. So I think you got to educate. You've got to uh, stop the drugs from coming in. The people that are pushing it, you've got to throw them in jail and throw away the key. Uh, the only the only time you'll be prosecuted for murder is if you are, you know, uh, the, like the grandchild of a celebrity. Then they go after the pushers like uh, Robert De Niro's grandchild. Um, I think you've got to have rehab services that are as easy as picking up the phone. There are no impediments, no social impediments, no financial impediments. Uh, I think you've got to take the pain patients and give them the pain medicines that they need. Yeah. Um, you've got to bring down those barriers and say, you've got pain. I'm going to take away your pain. I'm going to prescribe for it. I'm right. going to do it. Do it in a uh, in a safe manner and a in a, a good medically supervised manner, but I'm going to take care of you as well. Because we yeah, that's a, what's left out. It's we, left we out of every have, solution. Always left out. We didn't have a nidazine problem before the 2016 CDC guidelines came out. We we didn't have no. this illicit fentanyl crisis in 2016. No. And, no, and, and all, all these harms come. They still, every time they give solutions, even if it's now in 2024, right. part of those solutions is still, you know, it's it's naloxone, which is fine, illicit fentanyl testing ships, which is fine, safe supply, safe consumption sites, but they still, even now, say, continue to reduce prescribing. Still. Yes. Like, I don't know how much lower, sometimes I'm like, just make it illegal because it's already down to what it was in the early 90s before OxyContin. How much lower does it need to go? Yeah. The, the, you know, this is not a prescribing problem. The physicians have prescribed less opiate prescriptions every single year for the past 13 years. Um, yeah. The, and every state has mandatory reporting. Uh, the licensing boards are looking at it. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's a few, you know, irresponsible physicians out there prescribing, but man, they are few and far between. Absolutely. Much, much bigger issue is pain patients aren't being taken care right. of. Right, and and with all of these safety measures that have been implemented, I think, you know, I just got back from Michigan. We have a presentation, the DPF presentation. We're going to be traveling across the country. And one of our slides in the presentation uh, was discussing, you know, since the implementation of the, the database, the prescription monitor program, right? So you, all of those, that, that PDMP has been visited how many times, Bev? I don't remember, but it keeps going two up million, and up and up and up. Two, one least. million, two yeah. million, three at million. Least. And guess what? It's none of it's working. Yeah. Everything no. has been an abject failure, but these yeah. anti-opioid uh, uh, wackos, I guess is the word, <laughs> they, they just keep saying, keep doing what you're doing because yeah. the indoctrination is so thick. But 
when something else you and I talked about the other day uh, for my boyfriend's recovery was IV Tylenol. And you said, oh, I no. know you don't like it. I know you don't like it. <laughs> but it's not that I don't like it because I, 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 I did 10 years in a hospital bed. The only time I was ever given IV Tylenol is when I had pneumonia 105 fever we just couldn't get it down and IV they but they didn't want to use IV Tylenol and they said oh it's it's very expensive yeah and all of a sudden it's no longer very expensive and it's the panacea for pain relief what are your thoughts on IV Tylenol yeah um and wait plus opioids not just as a monotherapy for post op yeah the problem with IV Tylenol is uh and I'll just talk about it in a post operative uh, setting uh, is when people want to use it as a substitute for an opioid. It's not a substitute. Uh, and it's certainly not a replacement for a strong opioid. Um, it's it, it the, the setting where I find uh, IV Tylenol uh, is two, two settings. One, if you want to be part of this multimodal analgesia, ERAS program, and I want to reduce the amount of opioid that I have to use on you postoperatively, you're 80 years old. I would not like to use a lot of morphine. You're going to get confused and so forth. IV Tylenol can be part of that regimen to reduce your requirements. The, the, the setting that I have found it most remarkable in is there are some patients that wake up from anesthesia and even operations that you'd say, well, gee, it wasn't a big operation, like a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. You got a couple of little incisions where the scopes went in uh, and, you, and I've given them 45 milligrams of morphine in the recovery room and they're still hurting and they're legitimately hurting and they're wide awake saying my pain's eight over 10. And I'm thinking, man, I've given you three times the dose that I would normally give. Then I would give IV Tylenol. Were they redheads? <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily redheads. Uh, those, they're troublemakers, though. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'd order IV Tylenol. It's going to go in over 20 minutes. And I'd come back 10 minutes later, and the patient's sound asleep. Oh, okay. um, for whatever reason, it has, it has taken away this other avenue of pain that that opioid wouldn't get to. So I think it has, it's got a place uh, in postoperative pain management, but the, the problem becomes when the surgeon says, well, I'm going to be giving you gabapentin and IV Tylenol after you've had your knee operation. Yeah, that's well, common. IV Tylenol is not enough right. and gabapentin is not a somatic pain relief. Medicine. Yeah, I yeah. listen. I I wish I could go on all social media platforms and say gabapentin is a great pain reliever. I don't <laughs> know one per. I've got we, we got over thirty thousand members, chapters in all fifty states. The only people have ever said gabapentin was effective was for diabetic neuropathy and shingles. Feet. It helps yeah, Betty lose shingles. shingles. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think if you if you have neuropathic pain, it's certainly worth a try. But even in that setting, um, and my, my wife takes gabapentin for her CRPS, mm -hmm. uh, and, but she's like a lot of patients. It doesn't, it's not terribly effective. Um, it's effective in maybe 30 to 40% of patients with neuropathic pain, but in virtually all of those, it doesn't take away all the neuropathic pain. So for her, it's part of the answer. Um, and, uh, and for I, I think acute pain, that's just, it has, that's just, it has no place. No, you no know, place. Yeah. There in, so I'm an anesthesiologist, a member of the American society of anesthesiology. The most premier, our specialty journal is anesthesiology. It's the, it's the most premier anesthesia journal in the world. In 2020, there was a review article on gabapentin and Lyrica for post-operative pain. They reviewed 261 articles and they said it is clinically insignificant wow. in terms of treatment of pain post-operatively. It has no place for the use of treating pain post-operatively. Now, we're the people that 
put you to sleep and wake you up and take your pain away. So sure, you think sure. we could speak authoritatively whether or not this is a good drug for post-operative pain. At the end of the day, it's a capital N and a capital O. Can yeah. you send us the um, link to that if you have it? Uh, uh, I can find available? it, sure. Thank yeah, you so much. I, I, I would appreciate I, that. I want to do some light reading and I want to comb through those 261 <laughs> studies. It's a great article. And you I want to see it, yeah. Well, it's the kind of article that kind of gives me hope because uh, you're seeing some of things, some things like this. And the other article we talked about uh, in terms of, you know, giving patients adequate opioids while they're asleep and waking them up comfortably, uh, that maybe for at least for some physicians, that pendulum is going to swing back a little bit to say, you know, we've gotten, we've gone nuts with this opioid yeah. business. I also think a lot of, a lot of pain, let's face it, the pain clinics are run by the anesthesiologist. The younger anesthesiologists have found a great way to capitalize off of this. Some of these doctors are getting eight hours of training, doing the epidural steroid injections. And I, I think epidural steroid injections could be effective for some people, but I just, I just spoke with somebody who was forced to get 103 epidural yeah. steroid injections in order to get three pain pills a day. But these yeah. people don't know any better. How would they that, know? Right. That How is absolutely, know? you know, when, when I did epidural steroids in our pain clinic, uh, you know, the setting where it's where they're most effective is if you have an acute radiculopathy, I've got a sudden ruptured disc. It's pressing on that nerve root. I have this excruciating pain down my leg. And, you know, I think I got to go to surgery and take that disc out. Well, an epidural steroid in that setting will act as an anti-inflammatory, anti-edema, take pressure off that nerve root. It doesn't, it's not a pain reliever in itself, but if you can get some pressure off of that nerve root until that extruded disc resorbs itself and moves away from it, maybe you can keep them out of the operating room. And I've had many patients that didn't go to surgery because they got an epidural steroid, but that's on one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum is I've got back pain. Well, the chance of an epidural steroid helping you in that setting is close to zero. And so you need to select your patients properly. Uh, and then you don't just repeat them. Well, we, we, there's a, a sort of a general rule that you do a series of three. There's zero medical evidence that that's that nobody's ever studied that. But it's it's just one of those things that's accepted in medicine. Well, wow, I never that, knew that. that. I that didn't know it wasn't studied. But that was also created by the insurance companies, right? You've got all of these. Yeah, the insurance companies yeah. are requiring doctors to do a series of three before a patient can move on to surgery, which there's no evidence to support that a series of three is helping people. No. And when, 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 when we would do epidural steroids, um, if we didn't get a good response with the first, if it was a properly selected patient, we generally do a second. Uh, so some of those patients will respond after the second, but if they didn't respond after the second, I would tell the patient, you're 0 for 2. The chance of you responding to number three is about zero. I don't so think we you, ought to be doing a third. So you wouldn't encourage an additional yeah. hundred. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is just, no, when, and, and, these poor people, and I find that so many of these pain clinics have just become these drill mills. They're not even owned by doctors. These drill, these are owned by, you know, business people. It's these bizarre. Are owned yeah. by corporations and, and yeah. you've, you've got to deliver the procedures. I yeah. know by the end of the day, okay, well, how many procedures have you been given? And I'll tell you what drives me nuts is, um, when you see uh, see these places that are advertised as pain clinics, but we will not prescribe an opioid. That's exactly right. And in, they, they or they take people that are on like 15 milligrams of Vicodin a day and doing really well. And they'll say, you can't have this, but here, let me give you a spinal cord stimulator. Like it's yeah. un. remember that Crohn's patient who had her colon removed and the yeah. post-op wouldn't give her opioids and they were trying to put in a spinal cord stimulator for that yeah. post-op pain. 
She yeah, called I us from, a, I think it was Mayo Clinic. Right. I had a doctor on LinkedIn who's, you know, he was trying to sell me uh, a spinal cord stimulator for Crohn's okay. disease. And I'm like, what, what are you Lord have kind of idiot? Right. Yeah, but no thanks. They're, but they're banking or, you know, you've got these other pain clinics, David, who are, in addition to the, the gimmicks, right, forcing the procedures, they're taking people off of three milligrams of, I mean, uh, you know, three pain pills a day and putting them on 24 milligrams of buprenorphine, these yep. huge doses of buprenorphine. And then they'll call us because they're so, so sick, especially yeah. the elderly. The elderly are not, they're doing so horribly on, this is a great medication for heroin addiction, but, you know, have you seen a lot of success in treating pain with buprenorphine? Uh, I have to say, I don't have any personal experience in this, but I did a reel just a couple of weeks ago on the use of buprenorphine for acute and chronic pain. Um, and it, it's highly controversial. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem becomes, uh, and if a patient wanted to try it, I'd say, fine, we can try it. Uh, the problem becomes when you ascribe to the religion that opioids are bad for you. And uh, by God, that buprenorphine is going to be used for your pain. And if it doesn't take it away, what's your problem? That's it. Um, That's right. It's patient right. blaming. And I yeah. think it's so bizarre because they're but taking it stable... Opioid, but it is an opioid. Is an opioid. Yeah. yeah, but it's an agonist yeah. antagonist. So it's yeah. got a, a ceiling effect. You know... it. But to it me, is an opioid. Yeah. So it is what I want to talk but about. If a little, but if a little yeah. kid was to, you know, get a, get their hands on Suboxone, open that wrapper, put that in their mouth, that, that kid could die because it is an opioid. And yeah. I think what we're doing as a country, misleading people into believing that it's not an opioid is, is dangerous. Because But I want to, Claudia, I want to talk about this because I heard two CMEs just the other day, two brand new CMEs. One, it was a pharmacist saying buprenorphine absolutely blocks phalaginous opioids. So if you have a patient on buprenorphine, like Suboxone for pain, and then you can't give them like Vicodin at, for breakthrough because it will block it. And then another CME out of Michigan where they said it absolutely does not block the full agonist. So if you have a patient on buprenorphine and you give them Vicodin, if they say it's not working, it's because that patient is drug seeking. Do they even know what it does? Because it's so contradictory in all the information. My understanding is that you can, you can give, when you have a, a, a mixed agonist antagonist, if uh, you can, if you give enough other opioid, you can get the effect of the opioid. You can. Okay. To my understanding. But okay. I just want to say one thing about the pain clinics. You know, it's, I mean, it ought to be pretty easy. There are invasive procedures which can really help patients. Uh, sometimes a trigger point injection is really helpful for a patient. I get uh, radio frequency ablation of my cervical spine. I get the medial branch ablations. It's miraculous. Um, but if I needed an opiate, I would hope that my pain clinic would give that to me. Why is it so complicated? Do the procedures that work and are effective and give the medicines that patients need. Because they're teaching that it doesn't work. So why would yeah. they give it? And, but I want to talk about buprenorphine for it's a few more. It's an easy way out too. It's an easy, easy it is an easy out. way there out. And I think like even University of Michigan, they put Michigan Opium Collaborative did this whole uh, buprenorphine webinar series. And they actually said buprenorphine is our way out of this opioid mess. Yeah. So it's being shown as like, it, it, it's so bizarre because it's being shown as the solution and if a patient says it doesn't work, like you said, you blame the patient, but doctors get so angry if a pain patient, like on social media, if a pain patient says, you know, I took this, it didn't work. They get really, really angry about it. I was put on Suboxone in 2016. I didn't even know what it was um, as a punishment because I took five pills from my, a dentist for uh, abscess tooth and sepsis. And so they put me on Suboxone. I, I might've been on 30 MME before. I had no idea what it was. They didn't tell me. They took me from like 30 MME to 24 milligrams of Suboxone a day. It was the worst experience of my life. Like I couldn't get out of bed. Like I was so, I felt so drugged, but it also wasn't helping. I have Crohn's also, and I get frequent kidney stones. And so when I had a kidney, it wasn't working for that kidney stone pain. 
And I kept telling the doctor and he cut me off cold turkey, also not telling me what would happen. And it was such a horrible experience for me. And but you're not as a patient allowed to talk about this on social media without being absolutely attacked, usually by addiction medicine doctors. Like like for some reason, they're they're more concerned about protecting buprenorphine than they are about the patient. Why is that? Well, because yeah, they're paid. I, they're paid. There's a lot of angry people. All I can say is a lot of angry people on social media. <laughs> you think? Yeah. You know, you there's there's one addiction medicine doctor uh, who shall rename nameless, but his name <laughs> rhymes with Schmaler Schmickles. And he is, uh, I find him so, so young and so arrogant. that, And if you don't agree with him, he just attacks. And once again, I don't see that with the older doctors. I don't see this arrogance, you know, especially in somebody like you, David. But listen, if buprenorphine works for you, great. But Suboxone and Subutex is not indicated for the treatment of pain. Belbuca is. All oral buprenorphine is linked to denture decay, to dental decay, to excessive sweating, to feelings of flat affect. And we know that for sure. We have studies to support that. But, you know, they you cannot vilify a full agonist opioid and then glamorize another opioid. That's yep. not what is going to happen because it's been allowed to happen for too long. And, and this is what we like about Dr. Alfrey is he's very balanced yeah. in his views. And I just want to, um, I'm, I've opened up to chapter six, suffering in mm. your book, David. And because I was reading it, you don't see any of this anymore. That This is, you see, David is so pleasant. He was such a compassionate doctor in his book. You don't see that anymore by these anesthesia teams and the younger doctors. How can we, how can we make these doctors care about patients again? Yeah, you know, there's that's such a good question. Um, you know, they're getting into a system that is uh, sadly driven by money. Uh, Seventy-five percent of physicians uh, no longer work for themselves; they work for a healthcare organization or a hospital or or, or a big uh, uh, private entity uh, corporation. There's all of this production pressure that they're under. You got to crank the cases out. Um, a lot of them go into medicine. Uh, they, they go into practice with a lot of medical debt. The electronic record has separated us even farther from patients. Right. And that was uh, supposed to be the panacea oh, for everything. It's, but it's, we a disaster. We, right. We lost so many great doctors when the electronic health record system was created. I remember my gynecologist, she was crying. She said, I can't do it. I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm retiring. I can't do this anymore. It's just too stressful. And I think the Obama administration, it, it, you know, yeah. created that the EHR was created under the Obama administration. Yeah. Uh, I think the it tech, was high tech think or whatever. Clinton. But but it but it, it's been a disaster. Um, I gave a talk uh, to the Nashville Surgical Society uh, about a month ago, um, and uh, these are mainly crusty doctors, a uh, bunch of retired surgeons, some other surgeons still in practice. But they had a few people in training there, and um, I think I talked about some of this stuff and reminded them of you know, the key to having empathy in medicine, the key to treating that patient like a human being. Uh, and that is to never forget that what you're doing is a privilege. You're there for the patient, not the other way around. And if you can get that, then this doctor-patient relationship, this shared humanity that you have with it, um, it's just the most incredible experience in the world. Yeah. Um, and for the, for the people that are burned out, they need to remember, hey, that's, that's what you had when you went into medicine. And even though you've got all of these other impediments, you got that damn record, you got the pressure to, to, uh, you know, to crank the patients out, <clears throat> remember that's a human being. When I would pre-op patients, I had my own little technique. I always touched the patient. 
uh, if I listen to, I always listen to their, to their uh, lung sounds. I always put my hand on their shoulder when I did that. My GI and, doctor does that. And when he first yeah. did it, I was like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because we're, I love that. Because we're so not accustomed yeah. to that. But I love, like, I'm just sitting here thinking right. you are restoring my faith in, in healthcare right now because it has been so long since I've actually heard anyone talk like that about patients where, you know, because they make fun. Like, I don't, a lot of the things we do is take clips from actual, you know, presentations from doctors uh, about pain patients. And and all they seem to do is make fun of us and mock us and laugh about us. Like there's yeah. some knowing giggle. And it's so frustrating because, you know, the way they portray us and it's like they all forget that, you know, we're sick, like having Crohn's disease. I was in the hospital in and out for 10 years like Claudia and I missed everything when my kids were little. I was so sick for so long uh, before I was able to get into a good remission. And they just do away with all of that. They make it sound like it's all just psychological. And the whole reason why we're sick is to just get opioids. And thank you for saying that. I, I appreciate that a lot. The other yeah. thing I would do uh, before I left the room, I would always ask them a personal question. How long have you been married? Mm -hmm. Do you have any grandchildren? Just to let them know that, you know, you're not just a gallbladder. Your first <laughs> sweet. Right, and right. I also like that you didn't say the question you asked is were you raped as a child? Because that's what they seem to that's what they seem to ask, and that's yeah. all they want to say. And and well, yeah. You know, yeah. these I just have to say, these are the the high level um I mean to me, these are the these are the high visibility, infamous, famous, whatever you want to call them, doctors. Right. When I when I have this dinner. Uh, every two months with these retired docs, most of them have read my book and mo and all of them have said the thing that, that resonated with them was the idea that it was a privilege to take care of patients. Right. And there are docs out there that are young, that's, that feel that way. Um, you got to look for them. Sure. You may not find them. Uh, a lot of middle-aged docs still feel that way. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of impediments to remembering that that's what medicine is all about, mm -hmm. but they're out there. And so, you know, for pain patients that, that have had such a difficult road to find somebody with empathy, um, I would just encourage them, keep looking. Yeah. Uh, they, are, they are out there. My wife has a, a pain doc at Arsner in um, New Orleans where she goes for one specific procedure. He's probably in his early fifties. Um, you know, he's just, he's just the kind of person you want taking care of you. So they are out there. Yeah. yeah. That's, well, that's I, reassuring. I can, and I could tell you just hearing you say that you're these little sound bites of, of how much it's a privilege to care for people. Like it could actually make me, I could actually cry thinking about it. And I know that, um, so many patients out there who, you know, we hear from them every day when they just, they're going to, blow their brains out. Like they just can't do it anymore and they don't know what else to do. Um, I think just hearing that from a doctor is going to be really encouraging to them. So I, I appreciate your saying that. Let me ask one more question, David. So you graduate, when did you know you wanted to be a doctor? Um, I was in high school. I, uh, I, I went to an open house at a medical school and it just seemed so fascinating to me. Um, so I was pre-med when I went down to Tulane. I, I sort of like you know, I got waylaid in the French Quarter. I was the youngest legal bartender on Bourbon Street, almost flunked out of college, really? uh, but then somehow, you know, got back on the track. Mm -hmm. So um, you so you get your undergrad. What did you get your bachelor's degree in? English. In English. And then you applied to medical school. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I grew up by that time. And so I had to go back, uh, take pre-med requirements. Uh, got into LSU Medical Center, mm -hmm. um, and I never fit in at Tulane. It were always rich kids from private schools, and uh, I didn't have any money, and I was a public school kid. And mm -hmm. Then I got into LSU Medical School, and I said, these are the guys I went to high school with. Sure. Um, everybody was normal. Right, right. <laughs> so you graduate from medical school, and you decide you want to specialize in anesthesia. Well, I was going to be a surgeon. I was going to be a cardiac surgeon. Okay. Uh, so I did an internship in Kentucky, University of Kentucky, got totally burned out. Mm -hmm. And the chief of anesthesia there took me aside one day and said, you ought to think about being an anesthesiologist. And, you know, 
um, as a result of about a 20 minute conversation, I decided to change specialties and do my training in San Diego uh, based upon his advice and the fact that he knew the chairman there. And I thought the weather would be pretty good in Southern California. Right. So you, so, so you lived, lived decisions. So you went from Wisconsin to Louisiana, then from Louisiana to Kentucky, Kentucky. And then San Diego. And then San Diego. And then how long was your your training in San Diego? Yeah. Uh, back then, the anesthesia residency was two years. So I did that. And then I stayed for an extra year of uh, cardiothoracic training. So what makes... Uh, because Bev and I get confused when we talk about fellows. Yeah. What? Where does a fellowship fit in in all of this so you, you go to medical school and then you have to declare i guess some type of a specialty and then mm -hmm. you'll do your residency in that specialty and that could be yes. between two and four years and do people usually do those because i'm trying to find out where, where the ball drops after somebody has surgery i'm wondering if it's the residents who are anti-opioid or because you worked in a hospital yes all right well, let's try and figure this out because so all right, then you do your 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 training in anesthesia. Your you take boards, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Now you're an anesthesiologist and you're working in a hospital. Yeah, and by the way, a fellow just basically means I'm going to get subspecialty training. Okay. So you can have a you can have a fellow in surgery. Uh, I'm a surgeon, but I'm going to become an oncologic surgeon. So he's a fellow in that. Okay. And specialty anesthesia training. Uh, well, I do a fellowship in pain. I do a oh, fellowship. Oh, I got you. Okay. Yeah. That, now I understand. Yeah. So let's try to figure out where it all goes wrong for somebody who gets admitted to the hospital. Because it always went wrong for me with a hospitalist. Yeah. But because, you know, when you have surgery, I always, I've had amazing anesthesiologists, but I always see them before I'm, you know given anesthesia and then you yeah. never see them again. Yeah. Yeah. And I would always say, Oh my God, I have the nicest anesthesiologist and they're giving you that little cocktail and you're like, la la la. <laughs> and you love your you anesthesiologist. Love yeah. We all right? love our anesthesiologist. So, it is so much fun to give that cocktail. And then you, but then you never <laughs> see them again. So you have got this great pre-op and then now you're in the room and you're, I just, I just spoke with a lady, Rachel, I saw on TikTok massive she had this huge spinal fusion former heroin addict and she's been taking us through her journey so i emailed her i said hey if you need me let me know i'll advocate for you but where do you think the problem happens does the surgeon put order who's putting these orders in it's almost always the surgeon uh if you're in a teaching hospital let's say you're johns hopkins mm -hmm. well it's going to be the resident who puts the order in um uh, and they're you know ostensibly overseen by the resident above them who's a, overseen by the by the attending but a teaching hospital it'll be somebody in training and they have just had all of the indoctrination that's right. of how bad that's opioids right. that's right uh, if you are at a private hospital, mm -hmm. it'll generally be the surgeon. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they probably had the mandatory training uh, each year about the dangers and the hazards of, of uh, opiates uh, without emphasis on, hey, this would be a, this would be a, a good way to navigate your patient postoperatively. Let's use some non-opioids as a, as a base Ketorolac, something like that, a non-steroidal, and then you add opioids as necessary. Mm -hmm. It's not, I mean, it's not complicated, but I think there's so much bias and indoctrination uh, that you sometimes get in the hands of these people that say you're going to get gabapentin and IV Tylenol. Right. And at the hospitalist, I would imagine if you're at a teaching hospital, then you're going to have residents who are working under... The attending hospitalist, there's got to be, right? There's well, no yeah, you, you know, uh, it used to be you go to the hospital and your internist would take care of you. Right. Now it's just about entirely hospitalists. And these are an invention over the last 15 years. I know. Yeah. Um, yes. When I was first sick in the 90s, my GI doctor 
Mine would s- would do direct admits. Right. And too. then he was the one who did all of my orders and he, mm-hmm. someone from his office came every single day. There were, And yep. it was such a better experience than yes. it is now. Why did they change that? Why did they do that? Uh, I think a number of reasons. First of all, uh, medicine gets more and more complicated. And uh, the you know management of somebody in the office who has diabetes is far different than coming in with uh, ketoacidosis uh, and needing intensive management. So the whole specialty of a hospitalist was formed. Mm. Um, They're like and, the jack of all trades, master of none. Well, you know, the sadly, you know, these are internists and internists are not trained in Treating acute pain. No. My, right. didn't, my hospitalist didn't know what Crohn's disease was, and my mom thought he was kidding. No, okay. mine was the same thing. Mine was the same thing. And then the nurse was like, oh, I've heard from, I've heard of it because my cat actually had it. I was like, get <laughs> me out of here. Right. But but the one thing they all seem to know now is, is you don't ever use bad? opioids. Yeah. Opioids yeah. are bad. Right. They cause pain. And so you can't have but, them. That's the, the one thing. The other thing that's happening in the hospital, my cardiac surgeon friend who I mentioned earlier he just got out of the hospital. He had a, a small bowel resection and he was in there for quite a while. And he had the, the phenomenon of the silos. Uh, each of the specialties practices as a silo. And, um, you know, do I need all that IV fluid? Well, I can't touch that. You know, um, that's the surgeon's going to decide that. Right. Yeah. Everybody's afraid to make a decision. Uh, sadly, I think the uh, it's almost the only way you can get the kind of continuity of care that Bev described is with a concierge doctor. Yeah. And I'm a fortunate guy. I can afford the concierge doctor. So I have that. My wife was in the hospital last fall with pneumonia. He admitted her. He saw her every day. Um, but that's a, that's a rare breed nowadays. Sure. Yeah. I, we really do love our concierge friends. Well, it was a real treat having you on this podcast. Uh, and once again, uh, David Alfrey, Saving Grace, this is actually the last podcast that we are promoting a book for free. We didn't charge David, but if you're a doctor who wants to come on the doctor patient forum podcast, uh, we have a huge social media following. We're happy to promote your book, but you're going to have to pay from here on in. David didn't have to pay. He's one of my favorite people on TikTok. So don't forget to give him a follow. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. And thank you folks for tuning into the Dr. Patient Forum podcast. We're trying to get you help. If you've enjoyed this podcast and if you want to join in on this fight, please go to our YouTube channel, the Dr. Patient Forum, and click like and subscribe. That will help others find our podcast. We want to get as many people to follow us as we can so that when people search for this topic, they could find our content. Also subscribe to our Spotify podcast and give us a five-star review because that also allows people to find us. You can also follow us on TikTok. Mirandi one is our formal TikTok account. Be careful. There are a lot of fake ones out there. Also, you heard us give a new patron shout out earlier. We do have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash the doctor patient forum. And we have actually four tiers. There's a free section. So you do not have to be a paid subscriber to access a lot of content. And we have three tiers, $5, $15, $30 tiers. The top tier gets four coaching calls and all annual subscribers get at least one coaching call. You can also donate at the doctor patient forum.com under donate. Thank you so much for your support and please share our information. Share our Patreon page, share our YouTube channel, share our YouTube content, our podcast. We need to get this information out there to people who it hasn't been reaching. So we need you to do that. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for listening and have a great day. Just a quick disclaimer that the information contained in this podcast episode is not to be considered medical or legal advice. Thank you for watching. 